Hi, everybody. It's uh, Rick Allen, and you're attending the um, uh, Marston Theater Virtual Night Sky Series. We were doing this every other week, every other Wednesday. Or this time of year, we're starting at 7 o'clock. And for you newcomers, for the ones that haven't been with us before, I know we always have some people that are new and joining us for the first time, and some people that have been with us before for several other other uh, events. And so, so welcome all. Uh, and uh, for the newcomers, I'm just give you a quick introduction. My name is Rick, and I am the uh, director of the Marston Theater on the campus at ASU Tempe campus. That's uh, and the Marston Theater is actually in my background. That's that's it behind me. You see that screen with the uh, the uh, uh, the galaxies on it. It's it's also empty uh, because of COVID-19. ASU has the wise policy of not uh, having public on campus yet. But we have our hands full getting the students taught and getting through classes and doing the research that we need to do. And eventually we all know that we're going to be back and we're going to be live and we're going to be doing programs in the theater behind me uh, uh, soon enough. But until then, Meg and I, my colleague, and she's on the call as well, we thought, you know, let's, let's find a way to sort of connect with our friends and keep them updated and do some sort of like a continuous dialogue and what better way to do this uh, than using some of the technology from the theater and talking about the your night sky so every show has something for you to go out and look at uh, we'll be done by about eight and before we leave this particular session i'm going to give you some things to just go out in the, in the yard take the dog for a walk do what you do however you do that and and you'll have some things to go up and find in the night sky and so that's how we do it we also try to stay updated and keep you up to date on new missions and new ideas and things that are happening in the news and all of that and so so tonight really the whole first half of the show is going to be about asteroids and about meteorites and about debris in space and about some really wonderful uh, uh, program uh, that's going to happen next Tuesday. And it's, uh, it's about a mission. It's a NASA mission. And a milestone is going to happen. And we're all going to be able to watch it. We'll get to up to date completely on what that means and how that works and what you should look for next Tuesday. It's really exciting. And then uh, today, I also have a really special guest. The director of our school is with us. And so uh, she will be, um, I, I will introduce her in a little bit. And she'll handle the second segment of our program tonight. So welcome. And uh, and uh, we're just going to get started. I am going to uh, fire up uh, <coughs> another computer and share a screen. Um, this is actually from the, uh, this is the computer system that runs the uh, Marston Theater. And uh, it's a pretty sophisticated system. It's really a planetary engine, but it, uh, it uh, spits out uh, information and graphics and things in a really, really compelling way. On the campus, we do this in 3D. We can't do 3D over Zoom yet. Maybe someday we will, but, uh, but for right now we're not doing that. And uh, so I'm going to kind of just fire up a solar system for you because we're going to introduce you to asteroids. We're going to talk a lot about where those asteroids are, uh, where we find them in space, <clears throat> Uh, uh, and uh, some interesting things about what they're doing. And so uh, to do that, you can start to see some things moving on the screen here. Let me just label those. There's some of your planets. The sun's in the middle there. You see Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars are sort of like doing their little move around the, uh, the sun. I'm going to speed those up just a little bit. I want them to go faster. And then I'm going to back up just a little bit because I'm going to bring in the orbit of Jupiter so it uh, becomes kind of in our view here. And uh, so uh, the solar system is made up of the sun and these major planets. And the planets have been dominating the night sky so far. So for the last couple of months, I hope you've been watching. If you haven't, I'm going to show you where to find Saturn and Jupiter and Mars and what they mean in the night sky tonight. Uh, uh, and we'll sort of, that's how we'll wrap our program kind of towards the end there. But, but uh, I just want us to sort of know that the solar system isn't just a sun and eight major planets. There's a lot more going on here. There's a lot of space debris. There's a lot of things happening. Um, I'm just going to add to our scene here a little bit uh, uh, the main asteroid belt and sort of like come on where it exists in space. So you see it there. It, 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 it's organized to sort of operate. It's a belt of asteroids. There's millions uh, in, in number and it's organized to operate mostly because between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. 
uh, asteroids are named and categorized for where they are in space. So it's not necessarily types of asteroids that make their designations, it's where we find them. And it's a little bit, bit different way to think about it. The main belt is the most, uh, where most of the population of asteroids are. We've known about asteroids in this particular area for hundreds of years. Unfortunately, they're not visible to you without some sort of aids and help. You need telescopes to see asteroids because they're small uh, uh, and uh, they're, they're tiny compared to the planets and they're a long ways away. But when you go out tonight, and I'm going to just remind you about this later, so when you go out and look at Saturn and Jupiter in the southern part of the sky, uh, just remember that there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff in between you and Saturn and Jupiter. There's a bunch of, of material and debris and uh, things hanging out in space. And part of our discussion tonight, the science part of the discussion tonight, is, is what we learn from asteroids. So uh, planets are okay. We have one right here that we can look at geologically. We know what it's made out of. We know what rocks are made out of. We know all that stuff. But on Earth, we actually can't find any material that takes us back to the original solar system when it was actually forming. Everything on Earth has been rebuilt and reconstituted several times over. So we can actually go to space to learn things about the Earth. And that's what we're getting you prepared for tonight. We're going to just kind of go through uh, just a couple little asteroid uh, uh, important facts to remember. I'm going to introduce you to a near-Earth orbiting asteroid named Bennu. And uh, that is going to be sort of where we introduce the mission and next week's uh, tag up and, uh, and, and many, uh, many Radwas talk with us tonight. So uh, there's the main belt. I'm going to add another little set of asteroids. These are kind of fun. They're called Trojans. Trojans actually lead and follow the orbit of Jupiter. So you can see Jupiter in the background there. Let me just spin around so I get it into the foreground. And back up just a little bit. I can do that. So you can see Jupiter there, but I think you can also see there's this little sort of like there's this little cluster of gold colored dots on the screen. Um, in the background or, or next to Jupiter. So these are called Trojan asteroids. They actually orbit in the orbit of Jupiter and they lead and follow that great planet. That makes them unusual just all by themselves. So now we have two different asteroid systems that we're looking at here, the main belt, which we've already talked about a little bit, and then these Trojans. One of the reasons to introduce these is there's a mission I want you to kind of put in the back of your head. It's called Lucy. And what we're going to do is launch a spacecraft from Earth, and it's going to go out and visit one of these clusters of Trojans. On its way, it has another tra uh, a target uh, called uh, asteroid Don Johansson. And when it gets out to its cluster, it's going to visit five or six asteroids. And then it will swing back through the center of the solar system and out to the other lobe. So the project is called Lucy. ASU will have a spectrometer on board. Uh, so we are the PIs on a particular instrument that will help us understand the surface of these asteroids when we get there, when we see them, we'll be able to kind of tell what they're made out of and all that. Trojan asteroids are thought to be very, very old. The ancient, very first asteroids may be in the solar system. Other than that, we don't know much about them. So Trojan asteroids are in the, the future. Remember the mission, Lucy. Now I'm going to head back in towards Earth. We've talked about Trojans. I'm going to turn those off. We talked about the main belt and turn those off. I'm going to actually turn on a new set of asteroids called Near Earth Orbiting. This isn't meant to scare anybody, and these little sort of like dots are blown up really, really, really big. So just so you can see them, there you see the orbits of the inner planets, Earth and uh, uh, Venus and Mercury and Mars. And there is not as many asteroids as there are in the main belt, but there are asteroids that we call near-Earth orbiting, or NEOs. And we've known about these for a long time. And we have technologies and techniques to sort of identify the largest ones, and we follow them in space. They've been cataloged. We know Know where they are, uh, but it's kind of important to know that there is actually a little subgroup of asteroids that are very close to us. Uh, so a mission Lucy is going to take us later out to uh, the Trojan asteroids. We have a mission coming up launching in two years called Psyche that will take us out to a main belt asteroid. But now I want to introduce you to another mission called OSIRIS-REx and its particular target is called Bennu. First of all, let me just light up the orbit of Bennu. 
I'm going to change the way these orbits uh, come around here a little bit. I'm just going to kind of isolate the orbit of the Earth and Bennu. So Earth is spinning around the sun there, and there's a cluster of near-Earth asteroids around us. The green orbit is now the orbit of an asteroid called Bennu. Bennu is not very big, but you can see you don't have to watch it for very long to see how it interacts with the Earth's orbit. It actually comes inside our orbit for a little period and then it goes back out again. You see they're going at different rates. So for a while, they're sort of like not really even close to each other. But then after about three or four orbits, they come back into a, like a position where they get very, very close. So this has been known for a long time. Bennu is an asteroid that's not a big surprise to us. But several years ago, we proposed a mission. I say we, this is the science community to go build a spacecraft and go to, to Bennu and the idea is to grab a little piece of the new, grab some regolith off the surface and bring it home again. And so uh, this is really what's being prepared. This mission is actually run by our friends down in Tucson at the University of Arizona. The mission is called OSIRIS-REx and the event coming up is called a tag up. That means it's actually gonna do a touch and grab. So it's going to actually, the spacecraft is gonna get very, very close. Let me show you, I'm gonna show you some images uh, of Bennu, just so you see what it is. This is sort of what the object looks like. Uh, we've known for a long time that it was, uh, we've sort of expected it to be gravel encrusted, that it would have small stones and sand and debris. So the idea is we're going to just go grab some of that. That's called regolith, the stuff that sits on the surface of a planet, or in this case, the surface of a small asteroid. Uh, it's called regolith. And the idea is to send a little craft in there. It's going to get close enough, close enough to touch, grab, or actually puff some, uh, some nitrogen and send some debris up and then suck it into a little uh, a container so it can uh, touch, grab some stuff, and then move back again. It's a really very, very tricky mission. And uh, so you'll learn more about what to watch for tonight. That's, that's Bennu. Uh, I uh, did a little size comparison for you. I took a model of new Bennu and put it on the ASU campus. So uh, let me see if I can get that one up here. So you can see it's, it's actually not very big. I guess that's big if it were going to land on our campus, but it's actually in the scheme of asteroids, it's only about a half a kilometer across. I think I figured it's about 1,550 feet. If you want to do that, you could literally walk around Bennu if it were sitting on our campus in, uh, in a couple of minutes. It's not that big, large. It's also a funny shape. You see in some of these images, it has this sort of like big, huge, broad equatorial band, and the rest of it is just kind of like shape. shape. So this is an early model. And this is a really good comparison of the size of this asteroid. Uh, it kind of compared to my campus. And uh, so you can see what that is. This is, uh, for those of you who haven't been to our building, uh, the little pointer is at ISDV4. Here's the front doors and the Marston Exploration Theater is right inside. Uh, some of my students and I did something kind of clever. We took uh, an image, one of the images that, that came down once we sort of arrived at Bennu and then we started getting visual images and things like that. Uh, this is me standing in front of the screen at the Marston Theater. So if you can see my little image on the side, right, that's the big screen that has the, uh, the galaxies on it. And what we figured out is that we had an image from the surface of Bennu uh, that we could determine 30 feet of the surface of that object. So 30 feet of the asteroid and we put that 30 feet of the asteroid on the 30-foot screen in the Marston Theater. So I'm standing amongst that image, but those rocks are true to size. So on Bennu, as if you were sort of grab one of those, you see there's several of those bigger boulders that are about the size of a laundry basket because they look about the size of a laundry basket. And there's others. You can see the ones, kind of the light colored ones over the top of me over here. You know, these are football size, softball size, that kind of stuff. And then there is some smaller gravel there, but this was actually a kind of a surprise to the team that they were going to find boulders and rocks, not pea gravel and sand. And so this has become part of this, uh, this amazing project that they're going to try to, to grab some of this and see what it looks like. Uh, here is a really super high detail of this thing. We've been chasing it through space for several, several, several months now and uh, able to get really, really close up. They've been finding just exactly the right location to go down and do this grab. But this is, look at how much debris is here. Look at how this boulder pattern works. This is kind of in the Southern hemisphere. You can see the very edge of the uh, object here the, and space behind it. And uh, so this is, a, this is what this asteroid looks like. This is, this 
is the new, this is what we're finding. And uh, if you watch next Tuesday, I'm going to give you the dates and the times and how to sign up and what to look for uh, or how to, how to get, uh, get to the NASA site to watch this. And I'm ho hoping that everybody gets a nice introduction here and then you actually sort of watch the event with us because we're going to learn all together whether this little tag action is successful if they could get enough material, they're going to take that material and bring it home. And uh, this image here, this is just a, we call it an echo rectangular map. We've taken the surface of Bennu and just folded it out into a flat sheet. And uh, that little sort of orange dot up there called the orange gold dot up there called Nightingale was, uh, was the final selection, the final place where they're actually sort of picking to, uh, to go, go visit this. So, so that's uh, your big introduction. Uh, asteroids uh, are named and categorized for where they are in space. And there's many of them. There's trans-Neptunian asteroids. There's many different sub-asteroid sets that I haven't used tonight. A main belt, some really exotic, wonderful Trojan asteroids in the, in the, in the orbit of Jupiter that we're going to visit in, several, in a couple of years. And then Bennu. And the story of Bennu is unfolding just be, before our very eyes, a near-Earth orbiting asteroid that is going to be of great interest to us. That gives me a chance uh, to introduce our guest. And so uh, uh, Minakshi Wadwa is the director of the School of Earth and Space Exploration. I'm going to stop sharing so she can get prepared to share her screen. Uh, and uh, she's been in that role for about a year and a half, I think. She can correct me if I'm wrong there. And uh, almost a year and a half coming up. And uh, uh, many also before that was the director of the Center for Meteorite Studies. And so the theme of the show tonight is sort of like what we can learn from space debris, what we can learn from things from space that we can't learn from things from the Earth. And so she has spent years, her and her team, examining meteorites, right? This is stuff, rocks from space that fall to the ground. Uh, people find them. Uh, many of them get off to scientific laboratories like we have at ASU. And uh, we can kind of tease apart what sort of make those things happen and what's important about those meteorites. I asked her to come talk to us a little bit about this mission. And the idea is, right, what do we think we're going to find on Bennu? What is this regolith material? When it comes home, it's going to get divided up and people are going to be able to examine it. Is it going to be the same as meteorites? Is it going to be different than meteorites? Or what do we expect to hear or learn about our solar system and the origin of our solar system from grabbing some material and bringing it home uh, rather than just letting it transfer through the atmosphere? So many, if you want to come on and say hello, and thank you very, very much for joining us tonight. I think this is great. Well, thank you so much, Rick. Um, hopefully you can hear me uh, quite well. So um, I want to welcome each and every one of you for, for joining us this evening. It's great to have everybody here, you know, friends, friends of the school, new and old. Um, and I especially want to extend uh, a welcome uh, to Susie Marston, who I know is attending as well. Um, uh, Susie's support actually has allowed us to um, have this wonderful facility that we have on campus, which hopefully all of you are going to be able to visit once we are all able to come back to campus. But the Marston Theater really is an amazing facility. You can see that in Rick's background. And um, uh, this virtual night sky presentation, of course, is, is in part inspired by, by the facility that we have. And obviously we can't be in person for the moment, but uh, we hope to be able to return to that fantastic venue uh, at some point in the near future. So just wanna say a shout out to Susie and say thank you. And um, also wanna say a quick shout out to uh, my husband, Scott Perzinski, and my dad-in-law, uh, Ed Perzinski, who I know are in the audience as well. So. I um, just want to welcome everybody again. I think it's fantastic that you were able to join us this evening. So today what I'm going to do is to tell you a little bit about the OSIRIS-REx mission, um, which is going to be bringing back a macro sample of an asteroid. So we've actually got a sample back from uh, an asteroid. This was by a Japanese spacecraft called Hayabusa, and it brought back a few tenths of um, a gram of, of material, so tiny little dust particles. But what, what OSIRIS-REx is going to do is it's going to go to a very unusual asteroid, number one, very organic rich, very volatile rich material, which will give us some fantastic insights into how potentially organic materials uh, came to the earth and how life might have started on our planet. And basically give us some kind of insight into the building blocks 
of our own planet itself. And it'll give us that by bringing back almost four pounds, as much as four pounds of material. So really large samples potentially that we could analyze in laboratories and really understand something about the origin of our planet, origin of life potentially. So without uh, further ado, uh, let's try to uh, learn a little bit more about what OSIRIS-REx is about. And OSIRIS-REx actually stands for, it's an acronym, it stands for a number of um, topics that we're gonna learn about from studying the material that's brought back. So it's gonna tell us about our origins. Uh, there's going to be some spectral interpretation that talks about the composition of the material that's gonna be brought back. So that's just a sort of um, technical um, uh, sort of terminology to tell you something, basically telling you about the composition of that asteroid. Resource identification. So that also is composition related. So it'll tell us about what kinds of materials the asteroid is made of, made of such that um, you know, potentially it could, it could tell us about future uh, utilization of these types of materials uh, here on Earth. Uh, security as well, because this is a near-Earth asteroid. So Rick Tal told us about many of the main belt asteroids that orbit between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. But this is actually one of those asteroids which comes in relatively close to the Earth, because some of these asteroids actually have their orbits perturbed by gravity, gravitational interactions between um, Jupiter and the Sun, and so they get tossed into these very uh, oblique or actually elliptical orbits, and, and this is one of them. And so it's one of the asteroids that actually potentially in the future could impact Earth, and so we are going to understand very well what the trajectory of the asteroid is and how that trajectory is affected in the future. And so it'll we'll learn something about how to, how to secure our own planet. Uh, and then of course, Regolith Explorer, that's the last uh, little Rex uh, bit of the name. And that uh, essentially is um, also going to be telling us something about the structure and the composition of the surface materials on this particular asteroid. So that's, that's what the name stands for. So this particular um, asteroid uh, sample return mission is going to be going, as, as uh, Rick mentioned, is going to go to the asteroid Bennu. And this is actually um, an image that is uh, showing the whole of this particular asteroid. And I'll have another slide here that tells us a little bit more about, about the characteristic, characteristic of the asteroid in just a little bit. But uh, let's talk a little bit very quickly about the mission timeline for this mission. So this particular mission was actually selected by NASA in 2011, so just about nine years ago. Um, it was confirmed in 2013. It was launched in September of 2016, so about four years ago, almost exactly. And it encountered or arrived at the asteroid Bennu in 2018. So it approached, its closest approach to Bennu was around uh, August of 2018. Um, well, it was approached the asteroid in August and it was actually arrived, it arrived at the asteroid in December 2018. Uh, 2019 was much of the mapping reconnaissance site selection phase. So it was in orbit around this asteroid and it was mapping it very, very closely with the camera systems as well as the spectrometers on board uh, to understand the composition. And uh, basically enough, it gave us enough information to be able to select at least four different sites which are candidate sites, and then one, one of those sites is now the prime site from which we're going to be collecting. So the collection is actually going to be taking place, as Rick mentioned, next Tuesday, October 20th. That is the plan. And the plan is to collect at least 60 grams of material, but as much as two kilograms, so almost up to four pounds of material, asteroid regolith, will be collected. So uh, once the collection is done, um, the the spacecraft is going to depart the asteroid in March of 2021, and the return is expected to be on September 24th of 2023. So that's when we're gonna have the samples back in laboratories like mine, and we're gonna be able to actually analyze these materials very closely and to the best of our abilities in laboratories here on Earth. And we'll learn a lot about our origins as well as the origin of, of our planet and the origin of life and so much more. So this is gonna be a fantastic mission. 
So this is a picture of the spacecraft as it uh, looked right before it was uh, delivered to Kennedy Space Flight Center for launch. So this is at Lockheed Martin, which is where it was assembled. And you can see a person here for scale on the left-hand side. So this is um, a, a fairly large-sized asteroid. You can see this, uh, large, sorry, large-sized uh, mission that's going to be heading to the asteroid Bennu. Uh, this is actually just a, an image, a schematic, that shows all of the different instruments that are on this particular spacecraft. And most of these instruments are on there to be able to characterize the surface of the asteroid and to help to Help, help to pick the best site for sampling. So the main priority of this mission is to collect a sample and bring it back to Earth. And so these instruments are supporting that goal. So that, that's, that's basically uh, uh, the purpose of all of these uh, instruments. And so you can see there's a number of different spectrometers that are noted here. I want to call, you know, particularly mention the uh, OTES, which is the OSIRIS-REx Thermal Emission Spectrometer. This is an instrument that's being built right here at ASU, or it actually was built right here at ASU. It's of course on the spacecraft now and is doing its work. And so uh, we have a number of science team members that are at Arizona State as well. And so we're, we're quite heavily involved in this particular mission. And so the, the spectrometers are going to give us a lot about the composition of the surface. And then there's a suite of cameras, SAMCAM, MAPCAM, and POLYCAM. And these are all camera systems that are going to be of course, imaging the surface of the asteroid, imaging while the sampling is going on and after the sampling has happened so that you can actually see what happened on the surface after you've actually sampled. And so we'll be able to really see the whole process of sampling happen. And that's what's gonna be so exciting about next Tuesday because you'll actually be able to see the sampling going on from these cameras um, as, as it is happening. Uh, the, the key, uh, uh, Sort of components of the spacecraft actually TAGSAM, which is a touch and go sample acquisition mechanism. This is folded up here, but it essentially is a sampling head and an arm that is going to do a touch and go maneuver on the asteroid. The spacecraft's going to do the touch and go maneuver, but the sampling head is the one that's going to make contact with the surface. And then it'll withdraw that sampling head and it will put it back into the sample return capsule. And so this little cap that you see here will open up and the sample will be transferred in there. And then that capsule is the one that's going to return back to Earth. And that's what we're gonna collect once it comes back. So asteroid Bennu was actually um, discovered in 1999. And this is, as I mentioned earlier, a near-Earth asteroid. It's the second most dangerous near-Earth asteroid as, uh, as we know them. So there's something like, a, calculated to be a 1 in 2700 chance that it will impact Earth between 2175 and 2199. So sometime in the, in the future, there's a likelihood, which is not minuscule, a small chance that it might actually impact the Earth. And this impact would actually be something like the equivalent of 1450 megatons of TNT equivalent. So it would be a huge event, probably about four times or so the event that created Meteor Crater up north uh, in northern Arizona, actually. So so this, this would create some, some very uh, localized, but still very serious damage if it were to impact the Earth. And so this is a carbonaceous asteroid, very unusual. So this is not the most common type of asteroid. Um, it is very, very dark because it is very carbon rich, has a lot of organics, has a lot of volatile materials in it, and is said to belong to the spectral class B. So that's basically just telling us something about the composition of this particular material as we understand it from reflectance spectroscopy uh, of, of this material from telescopes here on Earth. So, um, and the asteroid of course is about 16, 14, 16, 14 feet across, 14, 492 meters. So that's the size of that particular object that we're going to. So, here are some other characteristics. This is actually in dark blue, you see the orbit of Bennu. It is, as I mentioned, a near Earth asteroid. So it actually comes into uh, much sort of comes in much closer to, to the sun and the Earth. Of course, it's an Earth crosser. So there is a probability of it impacting the Earth sometime in the future. And so this is quite different from, of course, the main belt asteroids, which are mostly in the, in the asteroid belt, main belt between Mars and Jupiter. And here are some of the characteristics of it in terms of its 
rotation period, which is about four hours. So that's when it, that's the, 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 the time that it takes to rotate once around uh, its own axis. And its orbital period, which is the time it takes to go around the sun is about 1.2 years. Bulk density is actually, it's about, uh, I think, let, let me put it in context. So for the well, bulk density of the earth is about four times as much. So this is much less dense. It's very much lighter in terms of its per unit mass um, than, the, than earth materials. So it may be quite porous. Uh, so the bulk density is actually quite low. Albedo is 4.5. All that's telling you is that it's very, very dark material. Next one, let's see. So here, this one is just basically talking about the connection between these types of asteroids and meteorites. And so Rick mentioned, of course, that you know we have these amazing meteorites that are part of the collection here at Arizona State. If you know, once we have the chance to be back on campus, I invite you to come and see our meteorite gallery, which is on the second floor of ISTB4. And you can actually see some of the carbonaceous meteorites that we have shown as part of the display cases there. And we think that asteroid Bennu might be similar to some types of those carbonaceous type meteorites, but it's really incredibly valuable to bring back these pristine materials from the asteroid itself from, with the sample return mission, because meteorites here on Earth, when they sit on the Earth, they actually interact with the Earth's atmosphere and interact with water and oxygen and and whatever else is around, and they essentially are not pristine anymore as a, as a result of the interaction with, with the Earth's environment. And so we have the opportunity here with bringing back these samples from Bennu to actually analyze some of the most pristine materials that we'll, we'll be able to analyze. And in that sense, I think you know, the organic materials are, are going to be the most interesting, of course, because they will tell us about potentially the, the sort of pre raw materials that could have uh, uh, led to the origin of life here on Earth. And organics, of course, are very, very, very prevalent in the Earth's atmosphere and Earth's environment, I'm sorry. And so uh, that's, those are the kinds of materials that actually will contaminate meteorites quite readily. And so that's why it's so valuable to actually bring back these pristine samples from the asteroidal surfaces to be able to analyze in laboratories here on Earth. And so, what I want to show you here, of course, is just uh, you know, a, a graph that shows sort of the orbits of a lot of these meteorites that we know have traced back to this main belt, mainly the, the region between Mars and Jupiter. And we know that most meteorites come from that region. Um, but essentially, before they come to the Earth, they have to actually get into these sort of Earth crossing orbits, which is, which is the kind of orbit that Bennu is on. It's much closer, actually, to the Earth than many of these main belt asteroids, but uh, that's what happens to many of these objects in the main belt is that their orbits get perturbed and they go into these earth crossing orbits and eventually fall on the earth as meteorites. And so here we are going to this asteroid that has the potential to impact earth in the future, but has not yet. And so we can actually go there and sample some pristine materials. So Bennu was, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Osiris-Rex was launched on September 8th of 2016, as I mentioned. And here is the um, rocket here ready to take off. This is an Atlas rocket. Uh, and the top of it, this is where, where, this, where the spacecraft is uh, enclosed in the very, very top. And this is launch day uh, and very exciting, of course. This is actually the launch, as, as you can see. And I, actually, what I'm going to try to do is show you a very quick video of the launch, which is always exciting to see. And I'm going to share that with you right now. Let's see. So hopefully this is the full screen. I think you might have to unshare your PowerPoint presentation. Are you showing the video right now?
Many, we're, I don't, we don't know if, um, if the uh, video you're trying to play is embedded in the PowerPoint or not. So, but if it isn't, then we do, we, we need to, uh, I think, unshare and then reshare your screen in the video format. Well, Minnie is organizing to uh, kind of to, to, to correct that, and we'll get her back in a minute here. I'm just going to use this little moment of silence to talk about uh, the uh, NASA feed. <clears throat> so in the uh, materials that we have on screen before and after the show tonight, there's a little slide thing, and, uh, and uh, there is a link to go to a NASA website. And when at that NASA website, this is going to happen, their, their broadcast is going to begin on Tuesday, the 20th at 2 p.m. And uh, then the actual tag that we were talking about is gonna happen at 3.10 p.m. And so there's about uh, uh, an hour or so of setup. And then as many says, we're gonna actually be able to watch the actual uh, uh, tag action. So this is Tuesday, the 20th. It's in the middle of the afternoon for us, uh, beginning at around two. And you can find those websites. We'll also send it out with some information at the end of the, uh, uh, when you get it after the program tonight. So, okay, Minnie, sorry. Uh, so was did the video show up or was it not no, showing no we sort of we still see basically your uh your stopped powerpoint and not the video so if uh, is the oh. video on a different uh, it's not in, embedded in the powerpoint it's not embedded in the powerpoint so uh, you just go ahead and stop share and then go ahead and share the uh, oh i see oh boy okay i'm sorry so let's see this is a little bit of a glitch so let me just let me try again should i do a quick one and then we can sort of go to questions or it, it gave me a chance to uh, just kind of tell people about the timing of the uh, of the mission okay let me let me try this again so let's see can I put uh, the, to the NASA um, event in the chat for good. oh yeah good. oh good can you see it now yep now we can see it there you go so all right hold on just one second this is not the uh, Let's just play this one video here because this is going to be the main. That sounds good. There's not any sound currently for us. I think you have to uh, stop sharing and uh, select the option to share computer audio.
Are you back, Penny? It's that it's that dang technology thing. Are you? Uh, oh, so it looks like um, you weren't getting the sound, huh? By that time we sort of like got the video part, but not the sound. <laughs> that's too bad. Yeah, that's um, so basically, I think uh, uh, yeah, technology sometimes is not our friend, but <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think the main point uh, that I wanted to make is already made in the sense that this particular mission is going to be um, a real leap forward for us in terms of being able to really understand uh, the, the way our planet formed, potentially how life came about. It'll also give us a handle on how we can secure our planet and protect our planet from near Earth asteroid impacts. And so um, if you want to go to questions, um, I'm you know, happy to take any questions or if you want to you know, address any. Um, uh, one just quick comment about the mission and, and people will learn about it next week. This is going to be kind of big in the news and everything. So, so you'll see it in the newspapers. It's a big deal for Arizona because of course there's, here's two major universities that are doing this. Um, uh, and I wanted to tell everybody that there's actually, there's an opportunity to do this sample grab uh, on Tuesday. Uh, and if it doesn't, if it fails, they have two more opportunities, but much, much later. So this is our first, uh, this is our only chance this count calendar year, uh, if they don't get enough or they don't get any or whatever, there's another opportunity to try this again. So, so it'll be a nail biter. I mean, this is really just not the engineers found that the regolith on Bennu, once we sort of have been able to in, in, image it and find out, is actually sort of much larger in scale than we sort of thought before. And so there's all kinds of things. But then many also, I guess the question for you is, do I have it right? Do we get some of the material at ASU? Are we part of the research team and yes and that's, that's yes indeed forward so to. exactly so we have uh, researchers here at Arizona State who are part of the science team for OSIRIS-REx they'll be involved in the preliminary examination as it's called of the material when it comes back and so um, and then of course I mean there are other researchers that are going to be um, requesting materials as well. And so it's gonna be available to the broader science community um, within six months of when it arrives. And so it'll be broadly available for analysis in laboratories across the world. And so there'll be a lot of focus, of course, on analyzing these materials. And by the way, I just wanna point out that my background actually shows the site called Nightingale, which is the primary site that um, Benu is going to be um, sample that. So you, I, I'm trying to move out of the way to show, sort of show the kind of spacecraft uh, outline uh, and the site. Uh, so there's sort of a flattish area that might be a safe place for the spacecraft to do the touch and go maneuver. And so the hope is that we'll be able to collect some really great materials from the site. This would be great. Good, really good to look forward to. So this would be good. I, uh, my, uh, I'm going to be tuned in. I suppose you will too, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so we're gonna Absolutely. Learn it together, as uh, Jim Bell would say, we're all going to find out together if this works or not. So, uh, so <laughs> it'll be good. Yeah. Okay. So if you don't, if uh, team is all right, let's just go to kind of the question and answer period. I'm going to turn uh, the uh, attention and uh, the microphone over to Alex and Sperti. Uh, Sperti Kachari and Alex Blanche are the students. They work in our particular team. They've actually had a busy day today. They were in classrooms a lot this afternoon, virtually, um, into some uh, eighth grade classrooms. So they're, uh, so they're kind of working a little bit of overtime. But uh, Alex, go ahead and you can uh, help us with some questions. Yeah. Thanks, Rick. Um, so real quick, I just want to give a shout out to uh, Mr. Solvis's class at Tempe Preparatory Academy. Um, Spurti and I, we were part of the student team and we did a class visit, a virtual class visit today, and it was good talking to them. And we, uh, of course, promoted our uh, show tonight. But real quick, I'm going to launch some poll questions for you guys to answer. Um, I'm not going to read the answers, the options that you have. I'm just going to read the questions. So uh, have you attended a previous night sky program? Uh, number two, what is the difference between asteroids and meteoroids? And then final, uh, where does the Orionid meteor shower get its name. So while you guys work on those polls, I'm going to turn it over to Spoo and she's going to answer some questions live. 
All right, thanks, Alex. Uh, so we have a question. Uh, why do the planets and asteroids orbit in a very similar plane and are not perpendicular to each other? That's a, that's a good question. So when the solar system was formed, it is um, theorized that uh, the gas um, that formed, the cloud of gas that, that, that formed the sun and the planets, it kind of spiraled in the same disk. Uh, and all the planets uh, are in the same plane, which is called the plane of the ecliptic, except uh, Mercury. Mercury is almost in the same plane with the seven degree tilt. Um, all the others have up to the maximum tilt is three degrees. So they have a three degree variation in the plane, uh, except Mercury, which has a seven degree variation. Um, so yeah, um, their formation led them to uh, led them to form a disk around the same plane. Uh, I hope that answers the question. Um, giving it back to Alex, let's end the poll. Uh, Looks like okay. Yes. Uh, all right. Okay, so um, we'll end the poll and let me share the results real quick. So, 79% uh, of you have attended a previous night's Skype program. That's great. We love having returners, and 21% of you are new. It's always great to have new people join uh, the community. Um, number two, what is the difference between asteroids and meteoroids? 56% uh, of you got the answer right. Asteroids are large bodies, and meteoroids are smaller bodies, uh, usually fragments that break off of asteroids. Um, so uh, once they enter the atmosphere, then they all become meteorites. And once uh, they hit the Earth, then they become uh, something different. So, and then number three, where does the Orionid meteor shower get its name? And 65% uh, of you got this one right. The meteors look like they come from the same place in the sky as the constellation Orion. So it's not that they're actually coming from the Orion constellation. It's just they're in a certain uh, location in space. And as the Earth orbits and they orbit, we kind of meet up and it looks like they come from the same area. So. Uh, that's the poll, and then I'll hand it back to Rick. Hey, thanks a lot. I, I, I feel obligated to make one correction there. Meteoroids are uh, uh, sort of in space, and meteorites are after they hit the Earth. So I'm just sort of like just, uh, yeah, but yeah, at least I think that's right. Many, did I get that one right? <laughs> Uh, so thank you very much. That's correct, Rick. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so uh, thank you guys. And uh, thank you for all those returnees. I'm just going to use um, some of the, we're, we try to keep this within an hour. So I got some more to share with you. Uh, I'm going to take you back. Um, oh, I guess actually this time I'm going to take you to a, a night sky view on my, uh, on my iPad. And for those of you who sort of seen this before, we just, this is a little bit chunky, just kind of getting it up. But I use an iPad and a, and a special program here uh, uh, called uh, Sky Safari Pro. And I've got two things for you to go out and look at tonight. And what I do is I sort of like preview this by taking my dog for walks in the night. And so I've just double checked over the last couple of nights and, uh, and we have some stuff to show you. So here is essentially a view of your night sky and this will be up as soon as we close the program tonight. So this is, this is current. So this is uh, as soon as we're done, uh, you guys can kind of walk outside and, and go out. And you can see that I'm facing south. Everything that's in the green band is below the horizon. Everything that is above the green is stuff that you should be able to see if you've got a fairly good view. Uh, you remember I said uh, planets are large and in charge. Uh, there is uh, Saturn and Jupiter are very, very bright in your sky, uh, uh, just uh, in the south. It's impossible to miss them. They are the brightest things there. But I'm going to actually show you a little asterism. It's called the teapot. And I'll show you how to find it. And then that challenge for, for, uh, for tonight is to go look at it. I've just done a little screenshot so I can draw uh, on the screen here. And so, of course, Saturn and Jupiter are here. Uh, they're in the sky. And then I'm just going to kind of draw out this little sort of teapot shape here. Uh, over on this side of it is a handle. Uh, here is the little lid thing. You guys starting to hum the words of a little nursery song, right? <clears throat> As it goes. And so if I just kind of connect these little stars together, you can see that that's, that's what we call an asterism. The constellation is called Sagittarius. Uh, but the reason to show this to you now and have you go out tonight or tomorrow or very, very soon into the night sky uh, is that this is kind of easy to find because Saturn and Jupiter are their markers, right? They're the, the sky landmarks. You can find them just come south down towards the horizon a little bit and just kind of look for this little cluster of stars and see if you can kind of point out or pick out uh, uh, the, this sort of asterism we call the teapot. 
Uh, the actual constellation of Sagittarius is actually a lot bigger. It comes down this way. Uh, Sagittarius is an archer. Uh, and uh, kind of in the middle of Sagittarius is another little constellation called Corona Australis. These are dimmer stars. They're closer to the horizon. They're going to be harder to see. But I'll bet you can find this, and I'll bet you can find that. And then one more thing to remember, just once you've found this, is if you just sort of like uh, kind of make a little steam come out of the spout here and all this stuff and sort of go up in this direction a little bit, not very far away is the very, very center of your galaxy. Can you see the Milky Way sort of tracing through uh, the sky right here? If you look at that little sort of area, just sort of, I just remember it because it's in the middle of that band of the Milky Way uh, galaxy and, uh, and, and in that particular location. So you're looking for the asterism called a teapot. It is Sagittarius. And uh, another reason to look at it now is because it's uh, starting to get low in the horizon. It's going to set very, very quickly. I'm just going to move to the east. I'll show you one more thing to look for tonight. And uh, then I'm going to finish and close big with a big, huge solar system view again. But uh, uh, now I'm kind of looking towards the east. You can see Mars is large and in charge, very, very bright above the eastern uh, horizon. I uh, hope you've been watching it, uh, watching it get brighter and everything. Mars was at opposition last night. So that means it is exactly opposite. The Earth and Mars and the Sun are all lined up. The Sun is on one side of us. Mars is on the other side of us. And we're all in a direct line. And what that does is it places Mars into a part of the orbit, uh, a part of its orbit near our orbit, and it's the closest approach. This happens, it's not very, it's not that rare. It's about every two years and seven weeks, uh, there is an opposition of Mars. So this is not something that is, but, and, and uh, it's always a bit brighter. It's always a bit easier to find in the eastern sky during that particular period of its orbit. Another thing in the east, I'm just going to show you real quick. Oops, I pressed the wrong button. Um, I'm going to go to back to another screenshot so I can draw something. Another asterism that I want to show you here is called this great square of Pegasus. So the asterism is the square. Pegasus is the const constellation. And uh, in this particular part of the sky, so what you'll see is horizon looking directly to the east. Mars is the first object. It's very bright. It's very orange. You see it. But then I want you to kind of, this is a bit of a challenge because these are all second magnitude stars. I want you to kind of take it and see if you can gaze and see if you could find this almost perfect square in the sky. Uh, it is known historically to mariners because it appears this time of year and marks kind of the eastern cardinal point uh, halfway around the year. On the other side in uh, the spring and early summer, it will be actually a western apparition. It looks almost the same and it marks the western part of the sky. And so if you can imagine sailors on the sea and out in uh, you know, sailing at night all around the, the world in perfectly dark skies, they would have their key asterisms, those things that they would look at as real reassurance and markers about sort of like where they're headed and certain parts of the sky. And uh, so I just want you to sort of uh, just, just find those. Uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, uh, I think uh, in the middle of November, we're also going to talk about some other things going on here. This particular corner of, uh, of uh, the square also sort of marks uh, the head of another uh, constellation called uh, Andromeda. Andromeda, you remember, is the one that sort of like was uh, tied to a rock and sacrificed to a sea monster and Perseus came to the rescue. We're going to be able to tell that entire story in about five weeks. So uh, we're gonna, I'm setting my calendar for our November virtual night sky. And we'll talk about Pegasus. We'll talk about the square again. We'll talk about Andromeda, uh, some science that is embedded in these constellations. Four more constellations will be up that make up that whole story. And so we'll sort of do this. So your assignment tonight, check out the planet right? Just make sure you see them. Look at Mars uh, uh, and it's going to be as about as bright as it's going to get uh, for the next couple of years. Uh, look for that square and look for that teapot and I think you're going to sort of, uh, you'll find those and, uh, and that'll be a sort of uh, something to look forward to. Um, I'm going to uh, just real quickly with our time, we sort of uh, did a lot of extra time on Meteorites. I'm going to just just show you the um, uh, the solar system again in the other program here. You sort of recognize this. Remember, we were looking at this. We were talking about asteroids. Um, I'm, I'm going to blow up to sort of like make Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, and the Earth a little bit bigger, so you can see them a little bit larger in the sky. And uh, importantly, I want to show you something about Mars and the Earth here. And so remember, I was talking about that opposition. Remember, I was saying that. Uh, 
Uh, I'm gonna reduce the sun's halo just a little bit, maybe make the sun just a little bit larger. Remember I was talking about that particular period where Mars in its orbit, Earth in its orbit, are both orbiting around the sun, and this is the part where Earth is lapping Mars. Uh, so you can see how it's just coming around, uh, just going past it, the Earth is going to continue. Uh, in this direction, it'll sort of like just keep keep going in this orbit this way faster than Mars. Mars will keep going in this direction slower than the Earth. So we've, uh, we're just at that point where we're passing it just now. I can show you the difference between last night and tonight. Uh, it doesn't move very much. I'm sort of like get into a position where I can see that. So this is where it is tonight. Um, let me just sort of like go to make sure I'm at tonight. Just so I sort of have it. Yep, there you go. Uh, and I'm going to go back one day. Here we go. Ready? What do you think? Did that make a big difference? Yeah. So, uh, so Mars is at opp opposition. When it is there, it's a very, very single moment in time. Um, uh, and that's, uh, that's, that's kind of important to remember. But it doesn't mean you have to just look at it on that specific night. So for several days, even weeks leading up to that opposition, and for several days and maybe weeks leading after the opposition, you're going to see that Mars is going to be just really, really easy to find, easy to look at. And then this is also the time if you can, uh, if you have an amateur telescope, if you have a friend with a telescope, if you have something like that, uh, this is a really, really great time to look at Mars. I was out last weekend with some friends and we were kind of like social distancing and looking at telescopes at the same, at the same time. And uh, I can actually see uh, features on the surface. So usually right in, on Mars, you see just a little sort of orange disc and that sort of marks its place. Uh, but in this particular case, it was big enough and I had enough view and it was a clear enough sky that I could actually see some dark features kind of like tracing across the surface of Mars uh, from a telescope in a backyard right here in Phoenix. So, so that's pretty easy to look at. And then um, there's just one quick view of what's going on. I'm actually going to flip this over. I probably kind of centered the Earth upside or the uh, solar system upside down. But uh, just sort of taking a look here of the relationship between um, uh, the Earth and Mars and also sort of what we're seeing in the night sky. So that should look a little familiar to you. Remember when I was saying to look uh, just towards the south tonight, you'll see Saturn, you'll see Jupiter, and this is the relationship of all those things in space. If I light up the main uh, asteroid belt again, you'll sort of see that there's a whole bunch of debris out there, a whole bunch of stuff going on uh, and that you that is in between us, right, between Earth and Mars, and now you sort of have a, uh, a complete program where you remember sort of uh, uh, asteroids and what they teach us about the solar system. You got some stuff to look at in the night sky tonight. You're going to tune into the NASA broadcast next Tuesday at two o'clock our time and watch that amazing uh, maneuver where we go tag and grab some material uh, and bring it home. And then join us two weeks from now uh, for um, our next installment of our Night Sky program. We're going to talk a little bit more about the stars in the sky. We're going to talk a lot about the area of the sky that has things associated with water, a sea monster and a couple of fishes and an Aquarius and uh, and uh, a lot of things sort of in a part of the sky that just seems to be uh, just just dedicated to water. I'm going to unshare this and ask Kim to go ahead and just start the slides and I'll just sort of like give you a, a, just a bit of a recap uh, and just to and introduce one more project to you but if she can get the slides going so you can see this in the background. Uh, I'm just a couple minutes from closing, but I also wanted to let you know that in uh, uh, October, on October the 24th, that's coming up, it's a week from uh, this coming Saturday, um, we have two really, really large signature events that we have always held on campus. One of them we call Earth and Space Exploration Day, and uh, that is the one coming up on the 24th. And then there is another uh, event in the spring that is mostly campus-wide, includes a lot of the same ideas and the same things. These are free, they're big, thousands of people show up to these things, and of course, we're not doing them on campus, but we are actually doing a version of it online. So I'm going to also put into your uh, your uh, thinking that we're going to do uh, an, uh, a virtual 
uh, Earth and Space Exploration Day. It's going to be from 10 to 1, and it is going to be on Saturday the 24th. And so if you can kind of watch for that, we'll keep it in the material. We'll make sure that you see it um, um, in your survey so you kind of have a chance to look at that. And what that will be is three hours of 10-minute presentations. You're going to hear from students. You're going to hear from grad students. You know, some of them doing research. Some of them belong to clubs on campus. You're going to hear from professors and researchers. Uh, and uh, the, the whole gamut of our school will be on display. And in a rapid fire succession, you're going to hear an awful lot about what we're working on and what we're doing. And you're going to meet a whole bunch of characters from uh, the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Earth and Space Exploration Day. Uh, so uh, thank you very much again for joining us tonight. Make sure to watch for the survey. It's coming out in a week or so. Uh, take it seriously. Do it. See if you can kind of like uh, 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 send us some notes and, um, and make sure we know uh, what you want to see because we take that very seriously. And we will see you two weeks from tonight and uh, on, on October the 28th. And we'll have another uh, Marston Theater virtual night sky on Wednesday the 28th at, um, at uh, 7 o'clock. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much for joining.